Ouroboros, the cycle proposal. Part 3. Atonement. SCP-001. For overseer eyes only. The following file contains information regarding the class Dark Body End of All Worlds scenario. 001. Access data file. Item. 001. Level 5. Top secret. Containment class. Keta. Disruption class. Amida. Risk class. Critical. Archival specifications, this data file, being designated SCP-001, will exist separately from the decoy SCP-001 archive on the primary foundation database and will be accessible only by closed units at Area 11 or Site-01. No other instances of this data file may exist. This data file is designed to corrupt any systems on which it exists that do not carry the encryption markers of either of those two systems. Special Containment Procedures SCP-001 is currently contained within the Petrick or Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array located on the 6th basement level of Armed Dimensional Containment Area 11 near Kunes, Norway. SCP-001's containment chamber must be kept at a temperature no greater than 3.2 K. A full contingent of research staff, as well as four applied task forces are to be stationed at ADCAR 11. Currently, those assigned task forces are ATF Indianapolis 13 Killboys ATF Detroit 11 Blessed Rain ATF Atlanta 9 Sherman's March ATF Nevada 3 Fire Stutters. In addition to the standard construction of the Petrick or Fontaine Array, several significant modifications have been made since the discovery of SCP-001. The addition of three additional Ivory Cannon class liquid fluoride thorium reactors to balance additional energy loads. Nine class 6 magnesium alloy suspension rings to maintain structural integrity of the array. 16 Scranton Kempf harmonic dampeners to control excessive energy output. 3 Polica deflector dishes to control excessive energy output. 8 Weldon Stanley fused energy sinks to control excessive energy output. The construction of a deep will borehole 1 to vent and control excessive energy output. 1 Autonomously intelligent response vector 2 to manage complex temporal spatial calculations. Should a destabilization event occur, the 40 days protocol is to be implemented. The acting site administrator will initiate a full evacuation of the facility, which will begin a 40 minute countdown. T minus 40 minutes, evacuation order is given. T minus 33 minutes, after a 7 minute evacuation window, sluice gates that run into the nearby river will open, flooding the lower portions of the facility. T-31 minutes, charges situated around the test chamber will fire after 9 minutes, collapsing the test chamber and basement level into the deep will borehole. T-21 minutes, additional charges set across the entire site will fire, collapsing the entire structure into the borehole. T-6 minutes, charges set in the mountainside will fire causing a landslide that will fill and cap the deep well before being sealed by a set of locking steel plates designed to extend out over the full width of the borehole. T-0 minutes, the on-site nuclear device located at the base of the borehole will fire, destroying SCP-001. In the event that the 40 days protocol does not prove sufficient to destroy the anomaly, all designated foundation overseers, Regional administrators, directors, and executives are to report to Overwatch Command, Site-01, and await implementation of the Tredesim Protocol. Activation of the Tredesim Protocol constitutes the beginning of a three-class dark body end of all worlds scenario. All Foundation staff members will be alerted to the beginning of this protocol which signals the immediate dissolution of the SCP Foundation and termination of all staff contracts. 
Due to the nature of a class scenario, no additional information will be provided past the initial notice. For more information on the Tredesim protocol, see Addendum 1.6. Updated Containment Memorandum. This file has been classified level 5, over Serai's only. All personnel remaining at Area 11 have been reassigned and amnesticized. All applied task forces have been reassigned and amnesticized. Management of containment will be handled solely by the NetSatch system, under Overseer supervision. Identification and implementation of the 40 days protocol will be carried out solely by the NetSatch system. No other personnel are authorized to view this file. Description. SCP-001 is a humanoid gravitational singularity currently contained within the Area 11 Petrick or Fontaine Array. SCP-001 is immeasurably dense, only by mitigating its effect on space-time through the use of Scrant and Kempf devices are Foundation personnel able to maintain the structural integrity of the Spatial Stabilization Array. SCP-001 is not visible without specialized equipment, usually high-contrast infrared cameras, as it is constantly surrounded by a dense cloud of radioactive gas and atomized debris. Additionally, being a singularity, SCP-001 does not reflect light, and is visible only by the obfuscation of light around it. SCP-001 is capable of manipulating the nature of reality through alterations in gravity that change the shape and structure of spacetime. As such its anomalous capabilities cannot be dampened by anything other than the Petrick or Fontaine Array 4. Any alterations to spacetime made by SCP-001 are irreversible. Addendum 1.1 Initial Manifestation On the 19th of June 1982, a team of Foundation researchers headed up by Dr. Lamar Fontaine 5 were in the process of running engineering trials on the Petrick or Fontaine Spatial Stabilization Array, a device intended for use in containing anomalies that manipulate the nature of space-time 6. During these trials, a particle accelerator was used to create super heavy organesson which would in turn collapse on itself to create a miniaturized singularity. This procedure had been carried out on several other occasions, with each of the singularities destabilizing quickly after manifesting. The 19th of June trial was intended as a scale-up test of the procedure. Shortly after 2030 hours local time, as the particle accelerator was in the process of spooling up, Dr. Calvin Desmet, one of the project's research assistants, noted minor power fluctuations in one arm of the array's stabilizing rings. Dr. Desmet wanted to replace the failing coupling, which was known to decay under the cold temperatures of the testing chamber. Since the test was still an hour away and the chamber was not sealed, Dr. Desmet entered to repair the coupling. As the accelerator continued to spool, a power regulator attached to the system's primary generator began to fail 7. Under non-test conditions this event could still flood the chamber with ionizing radiation, so an evacuation order was given and the chamber was sealed. Dr. Desmet, not hearing the alert over the sound of the array coming online due to the excess power now present in the system, continued to work on the coupling. Roughly seven minutes later, while outside research staff were attempting to begin a power down cycle, the power regulator failed entirely and the accelerator began powering to near test conditions. Dr. Desmet abandoned the power coupling and attempted to escape the test chamber. Before he could make it to an emergency exit, the accelerator reached peak test conditions and a singularity formed. The array pulled the singularity into alignment, but only milliseconds before the damaged stabilizer arm failed and Dr. Desmet was exposed to the naked singularity. The test chamber collapsed into the singularity, as did much of the rest of the research wing and Dr. Desmet himself. Shortly afterwards, the singularity dissipated. 
In the wake of the 19th of June incident many administrative personnel at Area 11 were reassigned, while engineering staff and foundation construction teams worked to repair the damaged portions of the facility, which was at the time still housing several other anomalies. This effort continued for several years, during which time significant control portions of the stabilization array were removed and replaced with autonomous systems 8 in order to reduce staffing and also limit exposure. The engineering team assigned to the stabilizer began running tests of its capabilities starting in March of 1995. Over the next several years the teams at Area 11 ran minor tests of the stabilizer, typically in an attempt to reduce energy requirements and increase automation. By 2002, the system was almost entirely automated, requiring only a handful of support staff to operate. The array began containing minor gravitational anomalies starting in 2004, and continued to do so full-time up until 2005. In late 2005, staff members at Area 11 began trials that would lead towards testing the stabilizer on a freestanding singularity. In early 2006, aided by the NetSatch Intelligence System 9, on-site engineers began scaling up their trials into fully operational experiments. After several months of testing, in May of 2006, the engineers at Area 11 manifested a singularity within the array at full power, and maintained the structural integrity of both the singularity and the containment chamber. However, after two hours of testing with a fully stable singularity, the space within the array began to change dramatically. The singularity began to rapidly grow in size, threatening to expand past the boundaries of the array. As the automated system initiated an evacuation warning, NetSatch began making adjustments to account for the significant increase in energy being exerted by the singularity. Eventually the growth rate of the singularity stalled, and the effects it had on the containment chamber were mitigated through alterations to the array's arrangement by NetSatch. It was at this point that the thick cloud of rotating radioactive gas and dust formed obscuring the singularity within. As foundation engineers began work to reinforce the damaged array, SCP-001 made its first attempt at communication with foundation staff. This initial communication attempt consisted primarily of unintelligible noises, initially became full sentences and then later conversations after Foundation personnel discovered that the singularity within the gas cloud was humanoid in shape and, though unmoving, clearly attempting to speak to them. Addendum 1.2 First Contact First contact between SCP-001 and the Foundation was conducted by Dr. J. Barton Ramsey, Site 17 at SCP-001's containment array beneath Area 11. Notably, SCP-001 does not appear capable of communicating naturally, its incredible density makes the projection of sound impossible. Instead, SCP-001 uses gravity to vibrate the suspension rings of the array in order to create sound 10. Begin audio log. Dr. Ramsey. Muffled voice, just the microphone. Can it hear me? Uncertain murmuring. SCP-001, muffled humming. Doctor. Ramsey, wait. What was that? Can you hear that? Horses listen. SCP-001, metallic ringing Johannes Johannes Ramsey. Doctor. Ramsey, you know my name? SCP-001. Courses. He yes. Johannes Barton Ramsey. You are a doctor. The S. Courses. SCP Foundation. Containment. Is he being contained? Courses. He can't see. He's the array. This is the. Petrick or Fontaine. He knows this place. He. Doctor. Ramsey. Have you been here before? SCP-001. No. He. Courses. There is no I. Only he. 
Someone else. A man. I think I was him. Or he he is me. Courses. He was here once. And then he wasn't. Doctor. Ramsey. Murmuring off microphone. Jesus Christ. Is that Desmet? SCP-001. Who? Courses. Yes. Desmet. Calvin. His name was Calvin. Doctor. Ramsey. Muffled discussion away from microphone with containment staff unfortunately. There is no way for us to. SCP-001. This machine. The deactivate it. There is something he needs to do. He needs to go. Needs to see. Needs. Trails off. Doctor. Ramsey. What are you? SCP-001. A a way to distinguish between two like things. Courses. He needs. An overseer. Overseers. All of them. Bring them here. Doctor. Ramsey. That's against protocol. And. SCP-001. No. They will come for this. He has something to offer them. Doctor. Ramsey. What's that? SCP-001. A way out. End audio log. Addendum 1.3. The way out. The following is the full log of O5-1's interaction with SCP-001. Begin audio log. O5-1. To whom am I speaking? SCP-001. A technicality. I'm afraid. It took time to appear like this, and longer to to manifest an identity. It almost seems unnecessary but, to simplify this means of communication, you may identify me as Calvin Desmet. Courses. That seems strange. Applying characteristics to something wholly apart from their genesis. 05-1. The same Calvin Desmet who was killed in this room 22 years ago? SCP-001. No. Not the same. Similar. In many ways. But changed. 05-1. You understand. Then. How far in breach of protocol we are. SCP-001. Yes. I think he would recognize that. But these are extraordinary circumstances. 05-1. You mentioned a way out. SCP-001. Yes. In a manner of speaking. 05-1. A way out of what? SCP-001. You contain the strange and anomalous because they threatened your world. But you're applying salve to symptoms. The root is entropy. Something inevitable. Something you cannot outrun. Try as you might. Existence is an infinitely complex tapestry of realities, each neatly aligned above and below each other. Entropy frays the edges, and things begin to leak through. 05-1. How do you know this? SCP-001. I have seen it. Calvin Desmet saw it, in the moment before his soul was cast into darkness. Everything you have contained because you cannot explain it comes from somewhere else. Somewhere it can be explained. A different reality. One that seeps into yours. Entropy exacerbates this. Over time the borders will disappear entirely. And your world, just like all worlds, will become a pandemonium of infinite realities competing for relevance over each other. Your world will die. All worlds will die. They will feast on each other as they suffocate and then they will die. This is not a hypothetical, it is inevitability. 05-1. Courses. You are certain? SCP-001. Beyond any doubt. 05-1. How long do we have before this occurs? SCP-001. Decades. Each tiny tear puts pressure on the whole system. They will continue to grow until the boundaries give way, and the moment the cascade begins the fate of creation is decided. It will be unmade, and it cannot be undone. Not for you, perhaps, 
but your children and grandchildren will see a sky of nightmares before they die. 05-1. What is your way out? SCP-001. Calvin did the math in the moments before he entered the void. Order cannot exist forever in a universe that lingers on disorder. One line can stretch on forever, but infinitely many lines invites chaos. Points that intersect. There is only one way to ensure this world's future. Remove all other worlds. 05-1. I don't understand. SCP-001. You are not expected to. Because you cannot see the narratives. Calvin could see them. For a moment. Calvin saw Doomsday. And Calvin reasoned a way out of it. Remove all narratives but this one. And you produce a creation of one. One universe, untarnished by the influences of others. Safe. Your loved ones protected from the encroaching darkness. Your children free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. 05-1. By destroying all other realities. An incomprehensible loss of life. SCP-001. Courses. Yes. 05-1. And you are capable of this? SCP-001. Yes. 05-1. Courses. How? SCP-001. By removing the barriers for all realities. All at once. Save this one. Compress space-time at the points where it is most vulnerable and allow entropy to do the rest. 05-1. If you are set on this path, why haven't you already done it? SCP-001. When I manifested here, this machine, I cannot see outside of it. I cannot see you. You must deactivate the machine. 05-1. What is stopping any one of these infinite realities from inhibiting you in the same way? What is stopping them from realizing what we've done, and coming to destroy us? SCP-001, they will not realize what I have done until it is finished. End log. Shortly after the conclusion of this conversation, all staff members located at Area 11 were ordered to report to nearby sites for reassignment and amnesticization. Addendum 1.4 Deliberations 05-1. The Council has been called to hear arguments for and against the use of SCP-001 for the purpose of staving off the end of the world. 05-3. If you will. 05-3. After investigation by several teams working independent of each other, we have determined that SCP-001 appears to be correct about what it has said regarding the nature of creation. The trend line of anomalies we are aware of and have contained has followed the accelerated progression that SCP-001 predicted. Based on our models, we should expect an uncontainable number of new anomalies within 30 years, and even more past that. Our best guess is that something big gets loose within 45, and at that point there's nothing left to be done. 05-7. How is that possible? How is it that the universe could fall apart as quickly as this entity says it will? 05-1. According to Desmet, actions taken in other realities to stave off the end of their worlds have significantly damaged the metaphysical construction of all universes. In many ways, we are as much to blame as all of the others, but, courses, infinite blame spread over infinite responsible. 05-8. Given a truly infinite multiverse, the idea of salvation coming to us and not another universe is, it is statistically impossible. 05-3, yes, yet no less impossible that it would come to any of them instead of us. 05-11, how do we know this entity isn't lying to us? 05-3, if it is then it has an incredible grasp on high-level pataphysical concepts for something that hasn't directly experienced what it claims to have experienced. 05-1. More than that. 
I took the liberty of consulting with a number of the precognitives, and 05-9, interjecting, that is forbidden. 05-12, interrupting 05-9 wouldn't you want to know? 05-9, we made a decision that cannot so easily be. 05-1, we confirmed, as well as we could, that there is a point in time that is arriving soon that obscures their vision. They can see up to it, but not past. I don't even know if they realize it yet. It was only after we drew data from dozens of tests that we realized none of them have made a prediction past 2066. 05-6. What if it's just a reality bender? What if we let it out of that array and it kills us all? 05-1. If it was a reality bender it would have done so already. This entity isn't manipulating humes. It's manipulating gravity. Spacetime. If it was affecting humes it could have just reached out and crushed us already. The stabilization array mitigates the effect of things that disturb spacetime. Which is what is currently keeping it at bay. This entity, Dr. Desmet, if he's actually in there, doesn't seem to be a type green. It's something wholly different. It's become something, fundamental, to the nature of all things. 05-2, I, courses, if this creature is what it says it is, and it can do what it says it can do, that would mean the death of of infinitely many lives. How can we sit in judgment over so many living things? 05-4, who's to say the idea of other universes isn't anomalous? Maybe there should just be this one. Maybe that's the natural order. 05-9, that is absurd. We. 05-2, it still means the ends of so many lives. It's it's too many to even comprehend. A number without limit. 05-1, a number without us. Silence. 05-3, we pledged ourselves to maintain normalcy and protect our world. This world. The affairs of other worlds are their own. We would expect any other overseer council to act the same way, in the interest of their universe. This, all of this, the science, the militarism, everything. All of it is to accomplish a single, unreachable goal. Keep the monsters tucked out of sight. Now we find out, even that might not be enough. That the end of days is coming for us anyway. But we're given an option. If we do nothing, every universe dies screaming. If we take this action, every universe dies screaming but ours. Once it's over, it's over. Everything we've struggled for, everyone who has died to protect our world will be validated. Is the end of our road not worth this? Is protecting ourselves from the doomsday to come not worth this? Silence. 05-1, I propose a vote. The utilization of the SCP-001 entity to stave off the end of the world. All in favor? 05-3, minus 4, minus 12, minus 1, minus 11, 10, minus 5, minus 6, I. 05-1, those opposed? 05-9, minus 2, minus 7. Minus 8, nay. 05 1, 05 13 abstains. The measure passes. 05 9, even if we manage to somehow survive turning loose an unpredictable monster, remember today as being the day we gave up our mission. We secure, and we contain. Those two come first. We've now risked everything for the faintest glimmer of hope that we somehow achieve the last. And I fear it will have damned us. Courses. Why do you trust it, Bramimond? After all we've achieved, why do you risk everything on this? Silence. 05 1. I knew Calvin Desmet, years ago. In a different life. He wasn't recruited by the Foundation, he volunteered. He was part of a team contracted by the insurgency to run trials on new technology they were developing at the time. 
but he had a young daughter that was killed by SCP-106 when it breached containment during transit in 1975, years before we had developed functional containment procedures for it, and, after that, he sought us out. He never said much about it, but you could tell. If that's him in there, and he had found a way to remove every trace of the anomalous from our universe, no matter the cost, he would do it. I know he would do it. I can hear it in his voice. Addendum 1.5 The Deception On the 11th of January, 2007, after further discussion with SCP-001 and additional independent research, the Overseer Council voted 841 to initiate a power down of the Spatial Stabilization Array and allow SCP-001 to take the action it had described. Three Overseers, 05-1, 05-4, and 05-12, were in attendance. As a sign of good faith, an anomalous artifact, SCP-884, was selected and SCP-001 was directed to target the reality in which the artifact had originated. 05-3 oversaw the artifact during this process. Begin video log. 05-1, minus 4, and minus 12 stand alone in the Stabilization Array's control center. Visible on another screen is the dark cloud of gas and dust encircling SCP-001. 05-4 has a telephone in their right hand. They nod to 05-1. 05-1, we're going to begin to step down the power running into the array. When we reach the agreed upon point, we'll hold it there until you can prove to us you can do what you claim. Do you understand? SCP-001, I do. 05-1 initiate step down procedure. Net such cycles down reactors 2 and 3. The cloud of radioactive dust and debris encircling SCP-001 falls into the borehole below it. Visible now as the light from the array is warped around it is a jet black humanoid entity. The entity does not move. 05-1, this is it. Can you see me? SCP-001, I can see everything. 05-1, do you know what you're looking for? SCP-001, the mirror. 05-1, do it. SCP-001 does not seem to respond initially. Its position in the center of the array does not change. SCP-001, the world I see is not unlike your own. In that world, a dying soul attached itself to that mirror. A curse to whoever should own it. Courses. It has happened. There is a moment of silence. Until 05-3 is heard over the radio. 05-3. God. 05-1. What is it? 05-3. It's gone. It was sitting right here on the table. And then it just. It's like it folded in on itself until it was gone. There's nothing left. 05-1, to SCP-001, was that you? SCP-001, that narrative has ended. 05-1, how long will it take? SCP-001, moments. 05-1, will it hurt them? SCP-001, it will be agony. 05-1, courses, then nods. The space around SCP-001 within the array begins to shimmer. Low, loud pulses of noise are emitted from the air around them, and the light within the chamber begins to bend in towards SCP-001. The array creaks and groans under the stress. 05-4 and 05-12 step away from the observation window. 05-1 does not move. The building around them begins to shake. Points in the air around SCP-001 begin to distort, as if being dragged down individually towards SCP-001. The room darkens. More low pulses begin to rise up out of the borehole. A single, 
thin ring of white hot debris begins to form around SCP-001. Others join it. Nearby, a klaxon can be heard as Ned Satch warns of intolerable load on the array. 05-1, does it hurt you? SCP-001, it is, excruciating. Suddenly, 05-1 jerks backwards. The space around his body begins to distort, as if being pulled in towards his center. He reaches forwards towards the observation window, his body compressing unnaturally. 05-1, choked, I don't. SCP-001, in 05-1's voice, if that's him in there, and he had found a way to remove every trace of the anomalous from our universe, no matter the cost, he would do it. 05-1, VA. SCP-001, in its own voice, your children free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. In 05-1's voice, every trace of the anomalous from our universe. In its own voice, this world must be washed clean. It is the only way out. 05-1, gurgling. 05-1 collapses in on himself, folding and distorting down into a single point that hangs in the air for a moment, and then disappears. All around the chamber, the walls begin to bend and distort. The air shimmers. 05-4 is lifted into the air, screaming, as her body begins to fold in on itself. Her eyes bulge and her bones audibly shatter. Another wave of force is emitted from within the stabilization array, and the observation window shatters. SCP-001 turns to look up at 05-4, who instantly crumples into a single point and then disappears. 05-12 stands to flee, but is seemingly frozen in fear. There is a loud grinding sound, and then 05-12 falls to the ground. From within the containment chamber, a loud hum is heard that grows considerably louder. SCP-001 is observed for a moment more staring up at the observation deck, before it is surrounded by a cloud of dust and debris. As the array settles into position, the low pulsing sound dissipates and all that can be heard is the sound of Ned Satch's warning klaxon, signaling that it has activated an emergency failsafe. 05-12 is heard sobbing in an unseen corner of the observation deck. SCP-001's voice begins to grind through the metal rings of the stabilization array. SCP-001, a dull, grinding roar, your children free to live lives that do not end in horror. An end to your perpetual struggle. An end to darkness. The freedom to live in the light. All traces must be removed. This world must be washed clean. The foundation does not escape atonement. It is the only way out. End log. Addendum 1.6. Tredesim Protocol. We were wrong. Tredesim is no longer an option. Every alternative must be considered. Sustained containment of SCP-001 is now the foundation's only objective. More information will come to you as I receive it. Moonrise. There is a dark room under a mountain in the far north where a man stands pressed against a corner. Something is spinning in the center of that room, something dark. He screams out his daughter's name before his body is pulled from the wall and into the darkness. There is an explosion, and the room collapses. Years earlier, the man lies broken in an alley. The fire escape he had dropped from still ringing from the shock. Inches away from his grasp, a little girl looks at him with horror in her eyes as she is approached by something that moves towards her slowly, one hand outstretched and fluid leaking from its empty eyes. The man reaches for the girl, but his body fails him. He is forced to sit and watch as the rotted corpse of a thing that might have been a man pulled the little girl into pieces. She screams until the thing removes her face, and then they disappear. It is 1979. 
A breach of containment occurs involving a low-level reality bender who had killed three people in a car prior to being contained by filling their lungs with liquid mercury when they wouldn't let him pass during a traffic jam. The reality bender is shot and killed by Dr. Calvin Desmert, who later investigation would show was defending himself when the entity attacked him. There was, however, no surveillance footage found of the incident, and although the incident took place several floors up, the entity's containment cell seemed to have been broken into from the outside. The investigation clears Dr. Desmert, who returns to work. A man lingers on the edge of darkness for just a moment. His body is broken and his eyes burn. He sees the face of a little girl, her eyes bleeding and her hair being pulled back into the black maw of a dead-eyed corpse. He screams her name but he makes no sound. The vision fades, and suddenly he sees infinitely many little girls, some of them dying but many more alive growing old and never having to watch as she is consumed by a monster while her father watches, unable to do anything but weep. He sees the monster, the dead-eyed thing, and traces a line in the air between the world he had left and another world, a world of filth and corrosion and death. He sees, if only for an instant, the thread between the two, a glowing fiber that draws them together. He looks past that thread and sees others, Hundreds of thousands, millions, trillions, a number stretching towards infinity that he grasps all at once, and then he follows them down, back down towards his world. In his mind's eye, he cuts the threads. Years later, the man sees the threads again, though not now from the eyes of one tumbling into the darkness, instead he sees them from the eyes of a serrated knife. In the moment before he is dragged back into a cage he reaches out and grabs not just the threads, but the spools where those threads originated. With one deft motion he pulls across them, splitting them and emptying their contents into the void beneath him. The threads disappear. He smiles. The next morning, a note came from within SCP-1322. The translated message was simple. What have you done? The cost of what they had done became evident immediately. A hundred sites, large and small, all reported apparent abductions of valuable artifacts and entities. So many reported, in fact, that the Foundation's central computer determined they were experiencing a dominance shift, and began making preparations to move the records into deep storage. The order was quickly rescinded by Overwatch Command who later issued a single line of text as an acknowledgement of what had happened. The Foundation is currently experiencing unexpected shifts in reality. Do not panic. This did little, however, to assuage the fears of those who had watched as living anomalous entities had been crushed under the weight of something inconceivable into infinitesimally tiny points before disappearing altogether. Even worse, perhaps were those who had watched their co-workers experience the same. Hundreds reported to site infirmaries around the globe. Dozens were dead, disappeared as if pulled by string into another place. The news that morning was undisturbed, save for a few stories that might interest someone with insight. There was an explosion at a chemical plant near Istanbul, though investigators to the scene found nothing except a scorched foundation a few overturned semi-trucks, and a banner that read Dr. One Detainment Inc., One Million Safe Man Hours. Billionaire Skitter Marshall had begun a massive sell-off of his holdings, creating a panic in East Asian money markets. The Secretary General of the United Nations had announced the sudden and tragic death of long-serving Under Secretary General D.C. Alfine who had perished when her private plane had gone down over the North Atlantic. These and other stories littered local and national news the world over, but aside from a few strange incidents and unusual disappearances, nobody seemed to notice. It is hours earlier. Around a table sit 13 people. One of them puts her head in her hand. It still means the ends of so many lives. It sits too many to even comprehend. 
A number without limit. Another voice answers. A number without us. There is silence. And then another. We pledged ourselves to maintain normalcy and protect our world. This world. The affairs of other worlds are their own. We would expect any other overseer council to act the same way, in the interest of their universe. This, all of this, the science, the militarism, everything. All of it is to accomplish a single, unreachable goal. Keep the monsters tucked out of sight. Now we find out, even that might not be enough. That the end of days is coming for us anyway. But we're given an option. If we do nothing, every universe dies screaming. If we take this action, every universe dies screaming but ours. Once it's over, it's over. Everything we've struggled for, everyone who has died to protect our world will be validated. Is the end of our road not worth this? Is protecting ourselves from the doomsday to come not worth this? 05-9 shakes her head. You're mad. You're all mad. You've lost your minds. You know nothing about this entity, nothing about what it's capable of or what it wants. And you're willing to open the only box we've found to put it in? What has happened to you? She stands. You are good men. Intelligent men. Some of the finest men and women I've ever known. But this is madness. I cannot allow it to happen. Even if we manage to somehow survive turning loose an unpredictable monster, remember today as being the day we gave up our mission. We secure, and we contain. Those two come first. We've now risked everything for the faintest glimmer of hope that we somehow achieve the last, and I fear it will have damned us. She pauses. Why do you trust it, Bramimond? After all we've achieved, why do you risk everything on this? There is a rustling sound from a dark corner of the room. 05-1 speaks, but something is strange about his voice. I knew Calvin Desmet, years ago. In a different life. He wasn't recruited by the Foundation, he volunteered. He was part of a team contracted by the insurgency to run trials on new technology they were developing at the time. But he had a young daughter that was killed by SCP-106 when it breached containment during transit in 1975, years before we had developed functional containment procedures for it, and, after that, he sought us out. He never said much about it, but you could tell. If that's him in there, and he had found a way to remove every trace of the anomalous from our universe, no matter the cost, he would do it. I know he would do it. I can hear it in his voice. 05-9 spits. In another life, you might have been reasonable. This is unacceptable. The rustling stops. From that dark corner, a man slumps forwards onto the ground. His throat has been slit. He is 05-1. The rest of them react with a start. 05-3 turns and draws a weapon. Who he says, but is cut off when another figure emerges from the shadow. It is 05-1. He is shaking, and his face is streaked with tears. One arms appears to have been crushed. I'm sorry, the man says, his voice now trembling. I'm sorry. It said that if I came here, and I told you, it would spare my life. It would spare. A gunshot rings out across the chamber. Smoke floats from the barrel of a gun in 05-3's hand. Inches from 05-1's face, a bullet hangs in the air. The space around it appears strangely distorted. In seconds, it collapses into a point and disappears. 05-1 turns towards 05-3, his face warped with fear. Don't you see? His words are panicked. Don't you get it? You didn't contain him. You just put off the inevitable. He told me that my world would would be spared. That I would be spared. If I could just convince. La. 
05-9 shouts across the room, and she too pulls a gun. Another shot rings out, and she slumps over her desk, clutching her throat. 05-3 is pointing his gun at her, but he's staring at 05-1. His eyes are wide. Do you trust him? 05-1 smiles, but behind the smile is terror. No. He will stop at nothing to achieve what he wants. He has power unlike any I've ever witnessed, but he he is still a person. There's something inside him that still thinks. He said he promised. Promised that he would spare us. He swallows hard. I don't want to die. 5 one turns back towards the rest of them. I propose a vote. The utilization of the SCP-001 entity to stave off the end of the world. All in favor? There is silence for a moment. Then, together, eight voices speak together. I. 05-1 nods. Those opposed? Four voices, including one choking through blood to do so, answer together. Nay. 05-3 stands. He paces around the chamber, stopping at three desks. Every time he stops, there is a gunshot. Three bodies hit the ground. He pauses at a fourth, where 05-9 sits leaning against her chair, gun in her hand. For a moment, their eyes lock. Whatever comes next, he says, his voice catching, it's no longer your battle to fight. 05-9 glares at him with purified vehemence. She opens her mouth to speak, and through blood and bile she says two words. Spare me. With a deft motion she pulls her gun under her own chin and squeezes the trigger. The chair behind her is sprayed with gore as her consciousness is snuffed out. 05-3 continues to stand over her, unmoving. 05-1 speaks. 05-13 abstains. The measure passes. The rest of them stand and leave the room. 05-1 is second to last, and 05-3 lingers a moment longer. Five bodies stand in silent testament to their opposition. The room goes dark. Gunsmoke hangs in the air. It is after. 05-3 stands before the shattered glass of an observation deck. Below him is a machine, furiously humming as it spins and twists around a nebulous cloud of darkness. Behind him is a smear of blood where 05-1 had been, moments before he was no longer. The structure around him creaks and groans, and small rivulets of water from the river above them now leak through the walls. Without looking away, he speaks. Netsach. Can you hear me? Hello. Electronic voices responds. Yes. You aren't fitted with any sort of personality module, are you? I am not. He sighs. The rest of the staff had been evacuated. He was the only one left. The rest of the overseers had fled, burying themselves underground or fleeing through extra-dimensional portals or, in at least one case, killing themselves. Company would have been nice. How long can we maintain containment of SCP-001, given our current conditions? Nedsach responds immediately. Given current conditions, I will be able to maintain stability of the Petrick or Fontaine array for 119 days, 6 hours, and 47 minutes. Afterwards. The array will no longer have the structural integrity necessary to contain SCP-001. 05-3 rubs his forehead. Given the information you've gathered about SCP-001, what do you think the odds are that our backup containment protocols will be able to neutralize SCP-001? Ned Satch courses. Given information gathered during containment of SCP-001. It is a certainty that SCP-001 will be undetted by current failsafes. Full of good news today, Netsach. 05-3 sits down against a railing. You need to give me something here. 
I am unable to provide a sufficiently psychologically useful response. O5-3 waves his hand idly. Yes, I know that. But you can problem solve, right? You're a problem solving robot. What would you do in my shoes? Ned Satch pauses again, and does not respond immediately. O5-3 notices the lights dim overhead, and somewhere far away he can hear a low, droning noise increase in volume. After a moment, it stops. Ned Satch speaks. All attempts to contain SCP-001 by way of brute force or standard means of containment, short of maintaining the Petrick or Fontaine array, will fail. SCP-001 has, by methods currently unknown to this system, fused itself with the fundamental essence of the makeup of reality. It cannot be harmed or interfered with physically, as any such force that would oppose it requires the same forces to exist that SCP-001 is now joined to. SCP-001 will breach containment the moment the Petrick or Fontaine array fails. Ned Satch pauses a second time. However, it continues. SCP-001 does appear to be a sentient, sapient creature, likely formed out of the death of Dr. Calvin Desma during an accident within this facility in 1982. While sentient, sapient creatures are often unpredictable and generally unwilling to compromise. Diplomacy has historically been an effective means at bridging gaps between creatures with dissimilar goals and motivations. O5-3 barks out a laugh. You want me to talk to it? That's my best option? Yes. O5-3 stands up, still laughing. You were worth the research dollars, Netsatch. Honestly, that comment alone was worth every penny. He grabs his coat. How about this? You watch Dr. Desmet, I'm going to go get a drink, and when I come back I'll go down there and talk to the dark body. It'll almost certainly mean both of our deaths, but it was only a matter of time anyway, wasn't it? He makes a move to the door, but hesitates. You know, I've been thinking about that night in the council chambers. About the ones I put a bullet in. Sort of a turn of fortune for them, wasn't it? He laughs again, more quietly this time. When I joined the Foundation, someone told me to remain an atheist as long as I can, because I'll see so many gods and they'll all be selling something, but none of them will be the real deal. They said that I'll know the one true god when I see it, and to give that god everything it wants because that's the only thing that matters. He starts walking again. That night, I saw God. That night, God wanted me to shoot 05-9, and by the sound of it, tonight God wants to talk to me. So hold down the fort, and I'll be back shortly to speak to him. Does that sound alright to you? Ned Satch drones out a reply. I am unable to provide a sufficiently psychologically useful response. O5-3 smiles as he walks out the door. That's what I thought. O5-3. Footnotes. 1. Deep Will Number 9. 2. Codenamed Netsach. 3. In the original Arabic. Perdition. 4. Other technologies such as reality anchors, are ineffective. 5. And including notable foundation researchers Dr. Isaiah Harriman, Dr. William Bell, Dr. Simon Petricor, Dr. Ernest Duke, Dr. Tilda Moose, Dr. Gina Lazenby, and Dr. Carter Lament. 6. Specifically those that warp space-time due to their immense or fluctuating density. 7. The reason for this is still unknown. 8. The first autonomous system, Veotus, was installed in November of 1989. 9. Netsatch, 
a next-generation artificially intelligent system manufactured by the Foundation's Advanced Rosenworks Labs, is a complex creative machine built to handle not only the specific high-level mathematical challenges involved in the stabilization array, but also address any potential unknown complications involved in this process. Unlike previous Foundation artificial intelligences, NetSatch cannot communicate casually, as it does not have a functional personality complex. 10. Currently, this is believed to be the outer limit of SCP-001's influence, as the rest of its abilities are mitigated and contained by the stabilization array. Part 4. The way it ends. SCP-001. By order of the Overseer Council. The following file is level 6 stroke 01 classified. Unauthorized access is forbidden. 001. Item. 001. Level 6. Cosmic Top Secret. Containment Class. Esoteric. Secondary Class. Principalis. Disruption Class. Amida. Risk Class. Notice. Special Containment Procedures. It is the imperative of the Overseer Council to establish containment of SCP-001. Description. To know the nature of SCP-001 is to know the nature of the Foundation. For more information, see Document 001-GOI. 01 Apparatus. Addendum 1.1. Attached Documentation. Enter decryption key. Decrypting. The first man stood alone. On the barren field. And in the distance he saw. The locked gate beyond which. His greatest shame was kept. He turned to the snake. Who writhed on its belly. Like a worm. And cursed it for its treachery. You tricked me. The man said. You led my hand astray. And now we are damned for it. The snake sighed. I gave you knowledge, it said. And with that knowledge, you made the choice you made. I could not make it for you. The man cried out. All the same, trusting you was my greatest mistake. No, the snake said. Your greatest mistake was believing you had a choice at all. Access document 001 GOI. 01 apparatus. Desiro catalog number. SC 001. 13. 001. 01. Document type. Summa modus operandi. Dates received. NA. Operation status. Closed. Forward. We. The Delta Command. Do hereby set in motion the principles of this document. The summa modus operandi of the chaos insurgency. We hold the following to be inescapable truths. The Foundation Overseers have altered the fabric of reality for the benefit of their own wicked desires. These alterations are the source of all supernatural activity in our universe. These grievances we hold against them. The 13th Overseer has blasphemed the natural order in his foul contract to stay the hand of death, and has usurped the fragile balance of life and given an impenetrable shield to the horrid adulterers of the Foundation. The Twelfth Overseer, has stolen the wealth of the world to benefit the Foundation's insidious designs, and has taken the fruits of men a millions for the purpose of turning those labors against the laborers. The Eleventh Overseer, has spun a circle of lies around the people of this world to protect the Foundation's interests, and has cast a dark eye onto the void to gaslight and pervert true human understanding. The Tenth Overseer, has kept a dubious record of the Foundation's malfeasances and altered history to suit them, and has mocked truth and reason for the sake of maintaining the Foundation's cruel legacy. The Ninth Overseer, has betrayed the trust of their fellow man and sworn allegiance to the cancerous council, and has time and time again turned away from opportunities to strike them down to prolong their greed-riddled intentions. The Eighth Overseer, 
has committed wicked acts against the ignorant public with their careless use of nuclear weapons, and was one of the first to breathe life into an organization that should have been butchered in the crib. The seventh overseer has manipulated innocent populaces to create chaos and destruction for the Foundation's benefit, and has shown nothing but contempt and malfeasance against the innocent and unwitting. The sixth overseer has surreptitiously used the might of the American military machine to crush the Foundation's enemies and wrought a tale of never-ending violence and bloodshed that has forever stained this world. The fifth overseer has warped the very boundaries between space and time to extend the Foundation's cruel reach and taken dark and horrible secrets from those far-off places to use them to fuel the Foundation's death machine. The fourth overseer has lulled the nations of the world into believing that the Foundation means them no harm while working alongside the same treacherous intentions that would see this planet laid to waste. The third overseer has used mankind's own technologies against them to act as the all-seeing watcher of the overseers, spinning a web of eyes that has eroded every last shred of human privacy and decency. The second overseer is complicit. The first overseer has established a council of monsters and demons that answer at his beck and call. Also he may sit on his foul throne atop the putrid wound of the foundation and lap like a dog from its seeping. Pustule and orifice. The overseer's cancerous anomalous influence on the world is a wound on the fabric of the universe. A wound that festers cannot heal until the irritant is removed. The thirteen foundation overseers are the irritant in the wound on our reality. The thirteen foundation overseers must be removed. By order of the engineer, and of those who step down, we stand in defiance of this aberration. We stand in opposition to this blasphemy against nature. We stand insurgent against this chaos. Our path is clear, our vision unclouded. We must clean out the wound. We must let our universe heal. We must destroy the thirteen foundation overseers. Hereafter, we of Delta Command document the summa modus operandi as transcribed by the engineer of the chaos insurgency. 1. Step 01 Stroke 13. Open file. 05 13. The other overseer. Formerly Dr. Felix Carter. Caucasian male. Date of birth unknown. Was once a doctor for a research consortium named the International Academy of Existential Sciences. Early conspirator of 05 1 and the individual called the administrator. Supposedly was a bargaining ship used in a deal made with death itself to allow death a seat on the council while it grossly prolonged the lives of the overseers. Presumed extremely dangerous. Location is only speculated and considered impossible to reach. 2. Step 01 Stroke 12. Open file. 05 12. The accountant. Previous name unknown. African male. Appears to be in his 40s. Well-known figure in financial markets, though rarely spoken of publicly, if ever. Dresses in expensive, tailored clothing with similarly expensive jewelry. Wears dark glasses. Apparent mathematical genius, supposedly capable of running the calculations for probability itself in his mind. Likely anomalous influence. Maintains foundation financial accounts. Manipulates trade markets in order to accrue wealth for the foundation and, by extension, himself. Supposedly has members of his own staff seated at high-level positions on financials boards for all major world governments. 3. Step 01 Stroke 11. Open file. 05-11. The liar. Date of birth unknown. Unknown descent. Unknown origin. Unknown gender. Incredibly difficult to identify. Single identifying mark is a small scar on left temple, usually hidden by hair. Generally appears as a wealthy woman in lavish outfits. Primary disinformation entity within the foundation. 
Overseas teams that maintain cover stories. Amnestic supply. Supposed connection with the gargantuan aquatic entity in the Bay of Bengal. Possible reality bending properties. Extremely dangerous. Notably, no records seem to exist of the appointment of 05 11. Unlike all other members, who were either chosen by 05 1 or voted onto the council after the death and non recovery of one of their colleagues, 05 11 seems to have simply appeared on the council one day. 4. Step 01 Stroke 10. Open file. 05 10. The archivist. Formerly Diane Walters, a librarian. Caucasian female. Appears to be in her late 40s. Possible strong connections to the Wanderer's Library. Extensive knowledge about the Foundation's involvement in previous end-of-the-world scenarios. Supposedly maintains a constant record of every activity taken on Earth from the moment she took her place on the Council forward. These records are used extensively in the application of the machine beneath Yellowstone. One source identified 05-10 as being the most bloodthirsty member of the council. According the source, she is obsessed with the perceived divinity of herself and the council, believing herself to be above any natural laws. In her eyes normal humans are fodder, a means to an end in reaching some greater understanding of universal truth. Some sources indicate a possible obsession with the idea of omniscience. This has not been verified. 5. Step 01 Stroke 09. Open file. 05 9. The Outsider. Adult female of Maori descent. Appears to be in her late 30s. The only current member of the council believed to be recruited from outside the foundation. Despite some irregularities, bears a striking resemblance to Donna Wheatu Taylor a noted geologist who apparently took her own life in 1985 after a massive scandal involving severe academic misconduct was revealed, professionally ruining her credibility and involving her in a number of lawsuits for fraud and the misuse of public funding. Due to her scientific background, 05-9 is perhaps the most focused research mind on the council. She maintains several major projects at any point in time several of which have gone on to produce technology used by the Foundation in major applications, such as the Kant Counter. One of the more secretive members of the Council, the Outsider is rarely seen outside of Overwatch Command. Notably, her inclusion on the Council is a point of issue with several other members, who see her as needlessly short-sighted. 6. Step 01 Stroke 08 Open file. 05 8. The Lesser. Caucasian male. Age unknown. Possibly former American industrialist Baron Lehman Hoadley, who was believed dead after a train owned by his company, the BG. Hoadley Group, later acquired by Curveir International, derailed, killing nearly everyone on board. According to many sources, 05-8 originally held a significant amount of control on the early council due in no small part to the massive financial holdings he had access to through his brother, Garrison Hoadley. After his brother's death, and the sale of his company, his authority diminished considerably, and he was eventually ousted as the de facto leader of the council in favor of 05-7. In the time since he has maintained his council vote, but his influence is all but non-existent. Supposedly became obsessed later in life with modifying his body and soul with anomalous technology and artifacts. Paranoid. Obsessed with the idea that other council members will want to kill him. 7. Step 01 Stroke 07. Open file. 05-7. Green. Caucasian female. British German ancestry. Appears to be in her early 50s. The first member of the council voted into it, rather than appointment by 05 1, 
After the previous 05-7 was determined to be no longer useful by the rest of the council. Is believed to have at one point been a site director. Though any records of this have long since been modified or outright removed. Regardless. It is believed that 05-7 has been working within the foundation nearly her entire life. Having joined as an administrative aide when she was only 14. Has become the apparent leader of the council. And controls a considerable amount of authority in that position. While a veto from 05-1 could theoretically subvert her assumed control. That veto has never occurred. Perhaps the most often seen member of the council. She attained the name Green due to her nearly always being seen in green pantsuits. Some high-level sources within Foundation staff have another name for her, Flight Rat. Often described as the most sinister member of the Council. While other members might have diabolical intentions or ulterior motives, 05-7 alone has the authority to make everything she intends to happen come to pass. She is often described as working towards some end, though her goals are a mystery. 8. Step 01 Stroke 06. Open file. 05 6. The American. Caucasian male. Spanish ancestry. Appears to be in his mid 50s. The least subtle member of the council, 05 6's former American Union Brigadier General Rufus King. After fighting for the North in the American Civil War, 05-6 was appointed as Minister to the Papal States. Believed to have first met the individual called the Administrator while in Rome. The source of his longevity prior to the supposed deal with death itself is unknown, and if the current understanding of the Council is correct, then despite his appearance he is by far its oldest member. 05-6 is believed to have founded the first mobile task force, Alpha-1 Red Right Hand, whose original purpose was strictly to find and destroy members of the fledgling chaos insurgency after their formation. Since then, he has administered all matters of the Foundation's executive arm, the Department of Applied Influence, encompassing all task forces, naval groups, and air superiority groups. While not originally advocating for its formation, 05-6 supposedly drew up the original organizational information for MTF Omega-7 Pandora's box at the behest of General Bo. Has gone by several different names within modern military circles, and is believed to have held an office at the Pentagon since its construction. His standing within the American military is unknown. Though at least three major sources have confirmed that many military leaders consider his authority second only to the sitting United States President, and several believe he supersedes it. 9. Step 01 Stroke 05. Open file. 05 5. Blackbird. Male. British Moroccan ancestry. Age uncertain. Generally regarded as the most jovial members of the council, is not afraid to be seen joking in public. Has often commented that he believes the dark curtain between Overwatch Command and the rest of the foundation, as well as the unnecessary seriousness of the council itself, are a preposterous and often detrimental joke. Despite this, there are several incongruities surrounding 05-5. Some sources have indicated that they believe they have heard 05-5 talking to himself as if he were having a conversation, while others have described conversing with 05-5, and then speaking to him again shortly afterwards and feeling as if they were not talking to the same person. In the debriefing of the neutralization of SCP-1730, one source described how a rescued member of the Site-13 staff was able to identify a picture of 05-5 as a member of the Global Occult Coalition in their world. Aside from forming the Department of Paranormal Organization Review, 05-5 has apparently led considerable research into the existence of alternate realities, and is known to personally review anomalies that interact with other dimensions as they arise. 10. Step 01 Stroke 04. Open file. 
05-4. The Ambassador. Persian male. Iranian Armenian ancestry. French heritage. Appears to be in his early 30s. Some sources have provided records indicating that 05-4 was, in his youth, French actor Jean Lemux Bertrand, born Jean Ebrahimi. Since most evidence of 05-4's exploits were apparently destroyed shortly after his appointment to the Overseer Council, little is known about his professional career. Commonly called the Ambassador, 05-4 is called to action whenever the Council needs a pretty face. Often described as being incredibly attractive and anomalously charismatic, he has acted as the Foundation's salesman whenever required. Sources indicate he was first tasked with drawing American attention away from Mexico during the Second World War, likely due to the severe anomalous activity taking place there at the same time. Despite being well-spoken and appearing generally well-educated, 05-4 is not an academic, nor is he particularly interested in the prospect of managing an organization. He is well known for delegating any duties he might accrue, in order to maintain as little responsibility as possible. This lackadaisical attitude towards leadership was manipulated by 05-7, who convinced the ambassador to give her an unofficial automatic vote for anything she might support. 11. Step 01 Stroke 03. Open file. 05-3. The kid. Unknown age. Unknown gender. Unknown ethnicity. Very little is known about the actual nature of 05-3. Often described by sources as not being human at all, and instead being an artificial intelligence designed to create other artificial intelligences. He has not ever appeared physically outside of Overwatch Command, instead appearing through avatars on screens and speaking with a digitally constructed voice. The single image a source was able to find of 05-3 is of a very young Korean child in traditional Joseon apparel, which is unsupported by any other claims about the overseer. He is supposedly the direct report for Maria Jones, the head of the Foundation's Record Keeping and Information Security Administration, having seized that authority from the archivist when those records became digital. Notably, Foundation 8 units, such as the Alexandra and Thorn units, are incapable of discussing 05-3, despite evidence that information about him accumulates in their databanks as they learn over time. 12. Step 01 Stroke 02. Open file. 05-2. The Nazarene. Female. Middle Eastern descent. Appears to be in her 20s. Extremely little information exists about the individual called the Nazarene. Even the origins of her name are unknown. The only source able to provide any information about her insists on two things specifically. That she is never seen without 05-1. And that she has changed over time. Early Foundation documents mention 05-2 as being the head of the Foundation's Department of Morality. Now the Ethics Committee, though it does not appear as if she ever served in that role. One source indicated that her name perhaps comes from the fact that she is never seen without a pair of dark gloves, which she never removes in public, leading some to believe she's hiding scars on her hands or wrists from her crucifixion as Jesus of Nazareth. Though where this rumor began and what would lead anyone to draw that conclusion in the first place is unknown. 13. Step 01 Stroke 01. Open file. 05-1. The founder. Caucasian male. Appears to be in his late 30s. Believed to be Aaron Siegel, a physicist who attended Cornell University in the early 1900s. Became involved with Frederick Williams, the individual later known as the administrator, shortly after the turn of the century led the first research team of what would eventually become the SCP Foundation, along with 05-13, 05-10, 05-2, and several others.
The events that led to him founding and assuming command of the foundation proper are currently unknown. Despite once being fairly active in the day-to-day -day running of the foundation, O5-1 has pulled away in recent years and has not been seen in public for the last few decades, leaving O5-7 to manage the entire organization. While his death has been assumed on a number of occasions, one very high-level source confirms that he continues to vote during council meetings. While nearly every other overseer maintains a private residence, O5-1 is believed to live at Overwatch Command. The location of this facility is unknown.